Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, here they come. Good evening to everyone who's arriving. Um, my name's Mark Bailey. I'm the IT Chairman at the Royal Fair Tech Society London. And this evening, I'm hosting this presentation. I'd like to welcome you all. I'm waiting for a few more people to turn up. I can see that so far we've got uh, 75 people have arrived. But in a few moments, We'll be starting this presentation on the subject of the story of the Maltese Cross. I can see now that we've got 78 people here. So I think this evening would, uh, at this time now would be a good time to start. So I'm going to introduce our speaker this evening, uh, Mr. Howard Hughes, who is a fellow of the Royal Fair Tech Society London. He's also a member of the Great Britain Fair Tech Society. And it is with great pleasure that I would like to invite him to begin his presentation on the subject of the story of the Maltese Cross. So over to you, Howard. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you. Okay, hopefully you can all see that now. Yes. Thanks. Just uh, minimize your faces on my screen so that I can see what I'm talking about. So thank you very much indeed for the invitation to present today. The uh, Maltese Cross, just for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a hand stamp used to cancel the original Penny Blacks and Mulready postal stationery um, that's originated in Great Britain. So it's the world's first obliterating postmark. The contents of this display um, are mainly from my collection, in fact, mostly from a competitive exhibit, but there are one or two pages from the post office archives um, or other sources, which I have uh, labelled each time if they're not in, actually in my collection. There is another display of mine on the Maltese Cross floating around um, on the GPPS YouTube tra channel, and I've deliberately tried to make this one very much different. So over half the material is different. The chapters that you can see here are not the same chapters. I've introduced uh, new ones at the beginning and on suburban offices and condensed a lot of the material in the middle. So if you feel frustratingly, I'm not talking about areas that you feel you'd like to know more about, then that will be available there. And at the end of this display, I will talk about how you can find out more about the subject if uh, you have such a high boredom threshold that you feel the need to find out some more. So starting off with the purpose and the origins of the Maltese Cross, the, we've discussed the purpose, but the origins very much lie in postal reform. So many of you will know that prior to 1839, uh, the postal rates within Great Britain were extremely high, probably about the cost of uh, an average labourer's day, uh, week's work to actually post some, some letters. Um, typically, they were six, seven, eight or nine p at a time. And because they were charged per sheet, um, that could multiply to several shillings. They were uh, largely based on mileage travels, the rates uh, that were applied. And 
because the post office had operated for a large number of years um, on the basis of simply making a profit, um, it wasn't too bothered about being efficient as long as it made a profit. And postal reform started to shine a light on this. Uh, so a number of recommendations were emerging out of the campaign for postal reform that was ultimately successful. We had a reduced and uniform postage rate, that we removed mileage based rates to make them uniform, we removed sheet based rates, and we incentivized postage prepayment. Because of the high rates of postage, a lot of people would not pay in advance. In fact, the majority of people didn't pay in advance for postage. They would simply uh, post something unpaid and allowed it to be paid upon receipt. The uh, incentivization of postage prepayment was quite simple. It was that we'll reduce the postage rate, but we'll double it if you don't pay in advance. And all these reforms made um, paved the way for another if reform that was another pillar of postal reform, but which was key to the development of the Maltese Cross. And that was that um, to make the service more efficient, we would introduce a series of prepayment tokens, what we now know as stamps or postal stationery, and that these could be purchased in advance in multiples, and that by doing that, the post office would be able to run considerably more efficiently because people wouldn't be going in each time. These prepayment tokens um, had been mooted for a number of years prior to postal reform becoming a fact, and so there was some lobbying about what they should look like, and this is um, probably a, a later reprint of, of James Chalmers' uh, attempts to lobby. He had this nicely designed penny stamp. And even at this early stage, James Chalmers is considering how to cancel it. He's got a Dundee date stamp of 1838 there. That, this is quite unusual for this time. And uh, the, the lack of thought about how to cancel stamps uh, continues later on as well. We had a competition in 1839 to design stamps and postal stationery once the battle for postal uh, or the theoretical battle for postal reform had been won. And um, this is James Chalmers' entry for or one of his entries for that. Again, it's a penny label used beneath the seal and again cancelled with a Dundee date stamp. I think it's fair to say that almost without exception that all the other entries didn't consider how the stamps should be cancelled. They simply put a lot of effort into the design of the stamps, which was laudable and very sensible. They don't, they don't want to be um, replicated easily, but nobody was really thinking about how to cancel them apart from James Chalmers at this time. One other exception. This is a Charles Whiting essay. I think you can see um, from this that it's, it's a much better essay than Charles Chalmers. It, it's much harder to replicate and it's placed on an envelope. No attempt to cancel, so you think not necessarily pertinent to this story, but it's the contents of the envelope that are. And this was an essay from the Mercantile Committee uh, addressing the fears of the papermakers who basically were afraid that they would be um, out of business if everybody used this new postal stationery and if there was a monopoly on the new postal stationery. And this essay attempts to extol the virtues of postage stamps and saying that, uh, that they will be the preferred form. One particular pertinent uh, part of this essay is this bit in the middle where um, I won't read this to you because it has a bewildering uh, set of phrases for the different post office stamp and stamps but what it basically says is that don't worry, when we use stamps, if you're worried that they might come off, all we need is a post office stamp that will tie it to the envelope. So a stamp that's bigger than the actual um, label itself, which will tie it both sides, and that will show that it was present, and therefore that will be sufficient to um, detect the fact that the postage has been paid. And this is establishing the need for a post office stamp just about for the first time. It was a post office stamp. The post office themselves were, I would say, at the best, on the periphery of the campaign for postal reform. They uh, had a, a monopoly position. They were a money-making enterprise for the state. They hadn't, I would suggest, uh, any interest in becoming more efficient and making less money. Uh, but that is the call that was placed upon them. They were charged with designing the original obliterator, and this is its earliest uh, known manifestation. It's on an internal post office document uh, sent to Lieutenant Colonel Mabley from uh, Bokenham, one of the superintendent presidents. 
And it basically says, this is the proposed design. If you like it, the contractor can make them at the rate of a thousand a week and the cost of a shilling each. Uh, most sources will say that that contractor is unknown, but I think based upon another article, uh, another item in the archives, we can probably make a, a reasonable guess as to who that uh, contractor was. This is a page um, in included in the postmark date impression books. And if I enlarge the bit at the top, it says the prices of stamps contracted for three years from the 1st of October, 1842. Uh, it's from Messrs. Morden and Company, Pavement, Finsbury. This is a firm of Samson Morden & Co, who patented the first propelling pencils, made some wonderful small objets d'art in the Victorian era, and were really high-class manufacturers they also made postal scales. And we can see on this price list, the second item from the bottom, brass stamps, one shilling. So those are the Maltese crosses. I would suggest, it's not a big stretch to suggest that if this company was supplying Maltese crosses at a shilling each in 1842, they were probably the original designer and manufacturer. This is what it looks like. This is the only surviving Maltese cross. Uh, Mike Jackson's recently found these photos on his phone. And uh, they're, um, as you can see, it consists of a brass head, very uh, well worked. This brass head is connected to a metal pin, which is driven under force into a wooden handle, and the two then become a mesh together. Uh, very sturdy and quite long lasting. So we've had the campaign for reform, we've had the what came out of that, the necessity for a post office stamp. We've had the post office designing and having that stamp manufactured. They actually ordered 2,000 of them as part of the original order. So they then distributed them in April 1840 to all the officers and sub-officers of Great Britain and Ireland. They didn't routinely send them to receiving houses that were not expected to cancel mail. And th we have here an accompanying notice. Um, there are actually two notices around about the same time, and we'll talk about both of them. This one introduces the Penny Blacks and has a, a line here that says, and I'm definitely going to paraphrase this, um, you will carefully stamp with a Maltese cross that's been forwarded to you, the Mulreddies and the Penny Blacks. The two former must be struck on the figure of Britannia and the case of one more, more than one Penny Black, uh, each must be separately obliterated. So clear instructions on how to, how to use the new obliterator. Around about the same time, another notice was uh, sent out, which detailed uh, that postmasters should avail themselves of certain ingredients for making the red ink. And the implication was that they should make that red ink themselves and probably out of existing resource, which makes this next uh, incidental expenses claim rather more funny. This is from the enterprising postmaster at Spittal. And he has here um, sent a claim for the red ink. It's dated, the, the entry is dated the 30th of April, and uh, the postmaster has explained the firm of Marshall and Son, a, a local chemist in Spittal, have, have uh, made the red composition and are charging two and six for it. This is the letter that that uh, invoice was in, or the, the claim was in. A normal return um, that went periodically back to the main post office whenever any incidental expenses were claimed. The bottom left, there's some scribbling. If we, if we enlarge that, we can see that um, this says that the claim for stamping composition in this account, being an unusual allowance, is humbly submitted for the secretary's consideration, Lieutenant Colonel Mabley. So this request for a prepayment or repayment of his expenses by the postmaster has found its way right up to the top of the post office and no doubt caused some consternation. Uh, we don't know what the reply to this is, but I suspect it was fairly short and in the negative. The Maltese crosses, as we said, had been distributed at the end of April 1840. Um, from London, the Mulreddies and Penny Blacks went on sale from the 1st of May 1840. And uh, many of them were known used before the official start date of the 6th of May. However, the ones that were used were not allowed or not accepted as payment of postage. It was agreed that they, um, they could pass through the post as, a, as an enclosure, but that's all. So this example here from the 5th of May and was handed over at the chief office and the person who handed it over had to pay a penny in cash in order to get it delivered. And all these Mulreddies and Penny Blacks known before the 6th of May 
I don't, I cannot immediately recall a single genuine example that has a Maltese cross on it. Clearly the postmasters understood the purpose for which the Maltese cross was intended. One of them. This is the earliest known postal use of the Maltese cross on a stampless wrapper. Um, there is another example, similarly, uh, dated a day later, that's, that's also probably genuine. One always has to be careful buying this sort of thing, but um, obviously there's a, a date stamp overlapping there, which under magnification can be shown to be on top of the Maltese cross. And this example is in a lovely doubled orange effect ink from Liverpool, which matches the date stamp and has a couple of certificates of expertisation. So the, the official day comes, the 6th of May, 1840, and we have the first day of use of the Penny Black and of the Mulready, and far more importantly, of the Maltese Cross. Three quarters of the first day usages were from London, so the, the example on the left is, is more typical. Um, provincial usage is much rarer, and the Penny Black on the right, therefore, is most unusual in that it's from Cirencester. Around about this time, there was a lot of um, comment in the newspapers about um, the Mulready's in particular and the penny postage. Penny postage was negative and positive, the Mulready's was generally negative. Very little comment about the, uh, the Maltese Cross. However, this is um, a cover that I've had in my collection a long, long time. It's written on the back of an unaddressed and unposted Mulready. And um, it had the feel of a newspaper article. It's headed New Post Office Atrocity and talks in not particularly glowing terms about the Maltese Cross. I, I assume, therefore, it was an unposted letter to a, um, a newspaper. Many years later, I was um, reading Bill Barrell's latest price list and he described a um, piece of newspaper that he had, which was contained some adverse comments on them already. And because of the quality of the scans in his, um, in his uh, advertising brochure, I was able to read the, um, the heading. And of course, there was a, a, quite a long article about them already. And at the end of it, there was this, uh, just separated by that little line that you can see above. And it said, new post office atrocity. I thought that sounds familiar from somewhere. And as I read it, I, I began to realise that this was indeed the letter that I'd got in my collection. It isn't the same letter because my letter misses the last two or three words, it isn't finished, and mine was never posted. So what I suspect my letter is now is simply um, the last of a series of letters that a correspondent wrote to various periodicals in the hope of getting published and eventually ran out of steam so this one didn't get posted. Um, just in terms of what this says, it describes the, the Maltese cross as a sprawling red arabesque and then even more entertainingly towards the end says, Mr. Rowland Hill has no business to tattoo the majesty of England into the resemblance of the queen of the cannibal islands. If I flick back a page to this, if we accept that this indeed is one of a series of letters written um, and to complain about the Maltese cross, and if we accept that the letters were published the next day on the 7th, as the, the next slide shows, then in order to include this penny black above it, that would have had to be a first day use of a penny black if only we could prove it. And finally on this section, in terms of the early use of the um, Maltese cross, we have here the first Sunday. I did say that three quarters of the early usages were from London. London didn't actually cancel mail on a Sunday. So the first Sunday is particularly difficult to find. Uh, you can see the uh, postmaster at York here was still feeling quite exuberant on a Sunday, having canceled this already quite uh, energetically. It soon became apparent that the combination of the penny black and the red ink wasn't that stable and that the red ink could in fact be removed by chemical means. I don't think that this happened on a grand scale at all, but I do think it caused a lot of consternation to Roland Hill, more for the damage this was doing to the reputation of postal reform and him, him personally than actually any great fear for loss of revenue for the post office. This is a, a typical um, article that appeared about this time that says, a master chemist of this town has uh, succeeded in removing the red ink. It then goes on rather entertaining to say that the authorities poo-pooed him and said that no, they could still see some red ink and it, there's no way this would fool their diligent staff. And so to uh, finally win the argument, he took another two penny blacks, removed the ink off them, 
put one in the letter and used the other to actually pay the postage and uh, got away with it. So this is a, an entertaining story, just the sort of thing the, the newspapers loved and something that worried Roland Hill. So Roland Hill went back to Perkins Bacon and started to get to work to consider a more secure combination of ink for the stamp and obliterating ink. And this is where the rainbow trials came in. So we have here um, some initial thoughts about testing the colour fastedness of the ink of the stamp, which is the top line there. And then the, the lower line, introducing an element of colour and seeing if trying to remove that made any difference. On a grander scale, um, this, this sort of thing happened as well, where we have black ink stamped, in this case a, a number, and various agents used to try and remove that number. And we can see here that these trials are becoming successful because to remove that black ink, you have to virtually destroy the stamp. And that's just what Roland Hill was looking for. Roland Hill did these trials in anticipation of being called to account over this, and indeed this duly happened. So this um, led to Roland Hill ultimately producing a, what is known as his report on the obliteration of postage stamps. And he did this in September, 1840. This document is a hugely significant document. It is written on folio pages of which the first dozen or so are Roland Hill's report. And then another 20 pages are annexed of various chemists reports. It's in the National Archives and repeated in full in a number of significant um, journals. This, though, is Roland Hill's final draft copy of that report that was in his estate. It contains the entire report written in, his, in Leddingham's handwriting, Leddingham was his secretary, and then various alterations in Leddingham's and ultimately Hill's own hand. And from this, we can see not just the finished report, which is identical to that in the National Archives, but also Hill's emerging thoughts as it was written, as he crossed bits out and replaced them with other bits. So it gives quite an insight when you read it in full uh, to understand the way his mind was working. So this report to the Chancellor of the Exchequer um, addresses the concerns that are emerging about um, the use of red obliterating ink. In the report, he says that he's now at the stage where he can recommend a black ink and talks about how to mention it. And he even goes further and absolutely trumps any of his critics by within the post office and um, within the Chancellor of the Exchequer by saying, and also I've requested that the superintendent president of the district post employ this black ink on a trial basis. Uh, and I did that a few days ago. So I'm, I'm well ahead of this, I'm well on top of it. Uh, so this here is uh, the first day of that trial, the 31st of August, 1840. The um, district post handled local London mail. So um, all the local London mail virtually all the London local mail, certainly all that cancelled at this office, um, from this point onwards became cancelled in black. Although he says for a few days, the trial didn't stop, it just, it just ran on. This trial proved ultimately successful, and in February 1841, the penny black, as we know, was changed to the penny red, and the obliterating ink colour changed to black nationally. Didn't all happen at the same time. So on the 10th of February, 1841, the other main office in London, the inland office that dealt with mail traveling out of London changed to uh, black ink. So here we have the 9th of February, red ink, 10th of February, black ink. The rest of England followed a few days later, starting from the 14th of February. And here's an example of the, the first day of the black ink there. Scotland and Ireland followed later again, slightly with here, Edinburgh showing the 17th in red, and the 18th in black ink. So we had a sequential uh, rollout of black ink across the country, and this was largely complete by the end of, sorry, by the 21st of February. That didn't stop some people from continuing to use red ink, but these were places were usually receiving houses that shouldn't have been cancelling mail in the first place and somehow had, had acquired a Maltese cross and were doing it. And this is examples from one at Great Haywood that was a receiving house under Rougeley. There were, though, a number of other unusual colours that uh, cropped up from time to time during this period, and I'm only going to show them very fleetingly here without too much comment, but they are a bit of a subject in their own right. So we have a magenta cross of uh, Han Rust, white Maltese cross of Simon Sester, uh, degraded from a, a pink colour, but still discernibly white. A blue Maltese cross, Truro, a consistent use there. Very unusual to find a combination of red and blue Maltese crosses. There's only two examples known, one on them already. Uh, and this is that one. 
and uh, green Maltese crosses occasionally crop up, usually not in such good shades as this, uh, and usually in Ireland when they do. Also during this middle period of use, we had what's known as distinctive Maltese crosses. Now these crosses are either crosses that were normal crosses that became distinctive, like this one here, where there's been some carving taken place by the looks of it into the design, or crosses that were commissioned locally, like this one, which was made locally in Edinburgh for, um, for Alexandria. This is a lovely shaped cross, I think, and it's usually struck in this wonderful shade of brown, which makes it really distinctive as well. Some other distinctive cross. This is a very rare Ross cross from Ireland, very similar to the Belfast and Cork crosses that must have had the same manufacturer. But this one uh, is a highly unusual, very rare and wonderful strikes there. Uh, very pretty Kilmarnock Maltese cross, the flower shape, very distinctive. The Whitehaven Maltese cross is the largest Maltese cross. Um, not in use for very long at Whitehaven, only a few months in 1841. Um, but we have here uh, an example used from 1855. Uh, and what happened here is that the cross resurfaced many years later in the nearby town of Egremont. And that's covered in a, a section that I'm not going to go into much detail today on the late use of the Maltese cross, which is almost a talk in its own right. And finally, on the distinctive cross is this wonderful hand-drawn effort from Dunnett. Um, speculation that the postmaster may have lost his Maltese cross and tried to cover up by um, this uh, incredibly lifelike replication that he did in ink. I think he just had too much time on his hands myself. Oh, sorry, I said finally, we have the uh, Channel Islands Maltese Cross, which I'm deliberately calling the London Ship Letter of Maltese Cross, because I believe that's where it was applied. Um, not all the mail bearing this cross originated in the Channel Islands, whereas all did go through the London Ship Letter Office. Moving on then to some unusual usages of the Maltese Cross. This is the um, excerpt from the postal notice from 1840 that I, I showed at the beginning, explaining how stamps should be cancelled. I'm particularly saying that Britannia should be cancelled on Mulready postal stationery. So we have here um, a Mulready letter that's um, gone through the post. It's got the Edinburgh date stamp there, but the Maltese cross has not been used, not only not to cancel Britannia, it's not been used anywhere. Um, I do have better examples of this in my collection, but the reason I particularly love showing this one is the addressee, who is one Sir Edward Lees. And the postal notice I'm talking about was in fact signed by Sir Edward Lees, the secretary of the Scottish Post Office. So here we have a letter addressed to the secretary of the Scottish Post Office, who's informed all, all his post office staff how to cancel them already. And you can see he hadn't bothered to do it. I'd love to have seen his face when he received it. Other examples of, um, of uh, too little use of the Maltese cross, uh, a single strike cancelling a pair, that's from Bradford in Wiltshire. At the opposite extreme, we can have too many uses of the Maltese cross. So we have the uh, um, example on the left where the postmaster at Peterhead had had Weetabix for breakfast and wanted to work off his energy. And at the right side, the postmaster at Spilsby, who periodically and consistently applied uh, an additional Maltese cross adjacent to the stamp. No idea how that practice originated or why, but it was a constant practice. And then some particularly um, unusual usages where the Maltese cross has been used for a purpose other than that which is intended. So on the right, we have um, the postmaster at Dune who applied um, his hand struck one to stampless mail where the postage had been prepaid and then canceled that with the Maltese cross and did this um, on at least three occasions. So it may well have been a constant practice for a short period of time. And then more routinely on the bottom left, we have an upside down hand struck two denoting tuppence to pay being canceled by Maltese cross and then replaced by one that's actually upright. I did say at the start that receiving houses didn't routinely receive Maltese crosses and this is true. However, there were some exceptions. The London, uh, sorry, receiving, uh, the role of a receiving house generally was to, as the name suggests, to receive mail, to then send it to its main office where it would be sorted and cancelled. In London, though, the service had moved um, beyond that um, several years before the introduction of the Maltese Cross, so that some mail didn't go through the main London office from the local London Post. And rather than change that back again and become less efficient, they simply adapted 
the, the use of the Maltese cross at the receiving houses. So what happened in London and the suburban offices, they all received a Maltese cross and they were told not to use it unless the mail was not going to go through the, the main office. And that wasn't, that was the minority of the mail. But the circumstances where this would happen would be if the mail was going to be delivered in the immediate locality of the receiving house, if it was going to be delivered along the same ride, and you can see a map of the rides here from the 1830s, and if the mail um, would be better transferred to the general post moving away from London without going through the centre. And we can just see a couple of examples of those. This is a, a delightful Maltese cross from Brentford. It's, it's a, a delicate green shade matching the Brentford circular date stamp. Unfortunately, it doesn't show very well on the screen here, but you can just make it out. If we look at the Brentford or the Hounslow ride below, we can see Brentford towards the left and Kensington two stops further down nearer London. So this was mail that was going to be delivered on the same ride into London, therefore it didn't need to go in London. So the postmaster at Brentford was able to use his Maltese cross. Had this gone through London, he wouldn't have used his Maltese cross. Uh, a somewhat less attractive cover, but, uh, but just as interesting. This is uh, a cover from Stoke Newington, which you can see on the ride uh, towards the middle and bottom there. And this is a mail traveling north that didn't know, need to go through London because at the north end of the ride, Enfield connected to Waltham, which then connected to the Great North Road. So the postmaster at Stoke Newington, knowing this, canceled the mail himself, and then it went straight north, connected to the Great North Road, and eventually ended up in Scarborough. Another um, city with their suburban officers of suburban receiving houses received Maltese Cross of Glasgow. And this is even more bizarre. It's not something I can explain and I would welcome anybody's thoughts on it. The Glasgow receiving houses received Maltese Crosses probably as part of the original allocation. They used them for two years and in maybe one case, maybe just crept into the third year and then stopped. And then this, these receiving houses didn't cancel mail again for over a decade. So it's just this interim, interesting starting period. No idea why it happened. What's also unusual is because these receiving houses presumably didn't receive the relevant postal notices, they didn't know what ink to use or they didn't, hadn't been told what ink to use. So they just simply got whatever ink they could. There does seem to be some sort of commonality to this ink in that most of them seem to be using a watery or fluidy type ink in a variety of colors that may well have changed over time and therefore be more similar to each other um, in the 1840s. So we'll have a look at a couple of those and you'll see what I mean. This is um, uh, box number four on the reverse of Blantyre. Uh, there's a, a fluorescent watery Maltese cross that's beneath the black Maltese cross. And I'm sure if you, you, you stare long enough, you can see that. It's really quite, in, in, in the flesh, it's really quite fluorescent almost and quite, quite uh, attractive. It's been cancelled in transit by a black Maltese cross as well. Then we have a box number 21 on reverse of Mary Hill with uh, another magenta or purple Maltese cross. Again, from these offices, the colour of the Maltese cross just about always matches the colour of the boxed receiving house mark. Why would they have more than one ink in a receiving house? And the final example is a box 30 of Pollock Shores in a, a sort of uh, mucky sort of brown. And we can see again, there's two Maltese crosses on this stamp. We have the brown one, which is particularly easy to see towards the right and the top and over cancelled in transit at Glasgow by a black Maltese cross. I've got something like a dozen of these different towns or different, uh, sorry, villages, um, all using uh, watery ink that match the box date stamp at the back. Some of them are over cancelled in Glasgow and some of them not. There didn't seem to be any consistent policy or any rhyme or reason to it. Anyway, the Maltese Cross itself, unfortunately, had lived a charm life for a few years. Uh, if we go back to Roland Hill's uh, report on the obliteration of postage stamps from September 1840, he's quite disparaging about the obliterator even then. Uh, this page, uh, I particularly like this page of his, you can see little doodles in the left hand side and lots of crossings out. If we hone in on that a little bit, <clears throat> these doodles had a purpose. So what Roland Hill was saying was, he's saying, I don't like the Maltese Cross, it's uh, light in the centre and the stamp is light in the centre. It's too small, so sometimes it misses a stamp or it doesn't tie it. And I think you'd be much better off using this other cancel that I've got known as a concentric ring cancel, which is solid in the centre. 
But I also I'd like to remind you that not only do I think you should be using that in preference to the Maltese cross, I said at the very beginning, we should be using a date stamp. And I don't, so why don't you do that? So I paraphrased him horribly there, but these um, doodles in the actual submitted documents are um, examples of the actual hand stamps. So we, this is just him um, laying out for Ledding and his secretary what he actually expects to see on the final document. So we can distill down Rowland Hill's thoughts to, to simply that the, the Maltese cross was too small and that it was hollow in the centre. As the Maltese cross was being replaced in 1844, there was an article in the Times, and this goes a little further in that it set, explains that the Maltese cross also didn't identify the office of use and therefore um, describes it as less businesslike than, um, than would be expected in this age. So if we combine those thoughts together now, we're, we're beginning to understand that the Maltese cross um, wasn't functional properly for a number of reasons, largely to do with its size and uh, the fact that it didn't identify the office of use. And many other countries would learn from this moving forward without actually having to go through the same pain. These were the proposed replacements of the Maltese cross. These were the suggestions of uh, Francis Abbott, who later became the uh, secretary to the Scottish Post. He suggested five different series of numerals that would identify the office with different series for England, Scotland and Ireland, and two different series for London. This is a, a page from the archives that broadly says when the, the councils were dispatched, but it doesn't actually give an accurate representation of when they came into use. And that's something that uh, requires us to look at the existing covers. Again, I'll, I'll, I won't go into great detail about this, but the English provincial numerals were introduced on the 1st of May, 1844. And here's a nice pair showing the 30th of April with the Maltese cross and the 1st of May with the numeral, both of those are from Liverpool. London, surprising, was a little later. So the earliest London numeral was the Inland Office numeral on the 17th of May, and that's a lovely first day cover there on the right, uh, accompanied by a cover from the previous day showing the Maltese cross. The other London office, the Sutton Post Office, that by now had become the District Post Office, um, changed a few days later. Scotland and Ireland were even later still. So this is a, the earliest known Scottish numeral on the 19th of June, 1844 from Glasgow. That's actually the first day of this numeral because uh, the Maltese cross is known used the previous day from Glasgow. Um, and Scotland and Ireland both took about uh, 10 days or so from, from this date onwards to complete the replacement of the Maltese cross. And so you think by that stage, the Maltese cross has uh, ceased to exist. But no, uh, and as I said, the, the late use of the Maltese Cross is probably a talk in its own right. I've identified so far um, of the order of 50 villages that continued to use the Maltese Cross after the middle of 1844. Without exception, those villages were not issued with numerals. They weren't supposed to be cancelling mail and they, just, they had acquired a Maltese Cross by fair means or foul in the previous four years and simply continued to use it. Most of these stopped within two or three years. Um, this cover here is an example that went on a bit later. It's 1854, so 10 years later. It's from the town of Maltby. Um, Maltby, I do know, um, acquired its Maltese cross by semi-legitimate means because it's entered in the proof book in July, 1842. So Maltby was issued a Maltese cross from London in 42, wasn't issued with a new mill in 44, and therefore carried on using its Maltese cross. And the addressee of this, um, envelope is particularly famous, I love this envelope, it's uh, for Her Majesty Queen of England, Windsor Castle, Berkshire, or elsewhere, all speed on death, and a little death curse around the word death. So this is a, a curse on anyone delaying the mail. Um, I've not shown the reverse of this envelope, but it bears several seals and has been reopened a number of times in transit for obvious reasons. And finally, uh, the latest known use of the Maltese cross at all is actually this example from 1887, 43 years after it should have been replaced. It's from the Edinburgh Money Order Office. And what appears to have happened here is that the clerks have pre-date stamped a number of money order stubs. And then at the beginning of the next day found that therefore the date was wrong. Uh, the date stamp is the 23rd of December, 87. That's been obliterated by the Maltese cross and the correct date stamp of the de December the 24th applied. This wasn't a solitary occurrence because on the reverse of this is a kiss imprint of one or two other examples. So clearly there are a number of money order stubs that needed to be um, corrected on that day at the same time. 
So I hope that this uh, potted history of the Maltese Cross has been of some interest. If you want to find out any more information, there's a, a great series of encyclopedia um, by Mike Jackson and David Rockoff. Um, the specialised catalogue, which has just been um, issued in volume one, part one, is now very much uh, up to date and gives a, a good insight into the use of the Maltese Cross. For those who um, take a great interest in the in measurements of Maltese Cross and able to identify crosses to particular officers, and then Johnny Ray has done a really interesting book that's uh, opened a whole new field of research in this area. And I think that the future could, um, could possibly show this book to be quite interesting. And then uh, finally, uh, there's uh, the old style work from the 70s, um, the Alcock and Holland book, which is uh, still very, very readable. Thank you for listening, and I'm delighted to answer any questions. Yes, thank you, Howard. Um, if you'd like to stop sharing your screen. Uh, with regard to the questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, if you'd like to make use of the Q&A facility, then uh, I'll be able to um, ask those questions of Howard. And I'm going to start with that straight away, if I may, because we've got a couple of questions coming in. Here's the first one, Howard. Um, comes from uh, Enrique Satoro, Satoro, sorry, and he asks, are there stamps with Maltese cross that isn't genuine? <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. Um... There are a lot, you have to be very careful buying anything expensive with a Maltese cross. It's a lot easier on cover, which is what I collect, but even then you have to be extremely careful. Add anything uh, of any sort of, any, any coloured cross, um, any, any um, distinctive cross that's expensive, particularly off cover, I would recommend getting a certificate. And obviously the Royal would be an ideal place to get that certificate. Uh, they are extensively forged. Um, with experience, you can usually tell the difference, but just occasionally some of them are so well forged that you really need to use quite special equipment to be certain. Okay, thank you. The next one comes from Colin Clark, and he asks, is there a biographical website or a page for Francis Abbott? Oh, I'm, I'm guessing there'll be something on Wikipedia. Um, I, have, I have found information out in, in the past and I cannot, for the life of me, think where it was. Um, it was fair, I think he was at a much lower level in London when the, when the design of the, um, the numerals was uh, put forward by him, but obviously was elevated um, within a few years to be Secretary of the Scottish Post. I can't, I can't for the life of me think where that would be, but I, I've, I know I've seen more information about him somewhere. Okay, thank you. Um, Kenji Nako, uh, Nakano asks, what was behind the use of two different colours on a single cover, that, as you showed early in your presentation? I prefer to answer that question without the last bit of it, if I can. Um, the, the use of two different Maltese crosses on the same cover, um, and indeed a number of co covers in this display, was for a number of reasons. Um, it may have been part of a redirection. It may have been that the original Maltese cross was in the wrong colour and that the postmaster um, of the parent's office wanted to make sure it was corrected. Um, it may have been that the original Maltese cross is not very clear. Um, I think that the cover that uh, where we have the red and blue Maltese crosses, what I think has happened, and I can't show this, is that the blue Maltese cross um, has been applied in error and two red Maltese crosses have been applied over the top of it to try and um, rectify that error. But of course, as red's a paler shade than the blue is, it doesn't really do it very well. Indeed, right, thank you. Um, Peter Coburn asks, why was the first councillor a Maltese cross rather than any other shape? Um, this was an internal post office matter. So although the campaigners for postal reform had really strong views on a lot of things, it was left to the post office to decide the means to cancel stamps. I don't think the post office cared that much one way or another. Um, they were not bought into postal reform. They'd be quite happy if things went wrong with it. They came up with a pretty and nice design with a minimum of effort, I'd suggest, um, where common sense and forward thinking people, even at the time, were suggesting better ways of obliterating the stamps. And that's coming from somebody who loves the Maltese cross. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I mean, Linda asked a question that's sort of related to that, Richard, which is that was there anywhere outside the UK where the Maltese cross was used? 
Yeah, it was well, the version of it was used in America um, uh, early days. I'm sure many of you will be far more familiar with that when, than I am. But I think that the post offices in those days were quite free with sharing information about the development of stamps. And I'm quite certain that um, words like don't touch with a barge pole and Maltese cross would probably be in, in a sentence that would help um, other authorities learn from the British. Okay. Um, I think there was some, some of these uh, Maltese crosses had numbers in. I know that you didn't really have time today to talk about the numbering. Uh, a, yes, number, a couple uh, of people have mentioned about the numbers. There were 12 numbers issued to the London Inland Office, and this was in 1843. And this was the beginning of understanding why the Maltese cross wasn't functioning correctly, and that these numbered crosses were all bigger and they had numbers in the middle. So they actually rectified some of the complaints about the Maltese cross. We don't know why there were 12 numbers issued to the same office, but they may be in, um, indicating which desk was used. And certainly, um, there's a lot of research gone into those, but there just wasn't time to touch on that subject today. Hey, thank you. Um, uh, Anne Ray is asking, are the Maltese cross wooden or metal stamps themselves uh, sought after in, in their own right? Yes, yeah, so um, the actual um, councillors themselves. There is only one remaining. I believe it's on the opposite side of the pond from where we currently sit. Um, I won't mention the sort of money it went for, but it wasn't cheap. Um, so very much sought after, yes, uh, but there is only one of them that we know of. Okay. And I think it looks to me to be a final question um, at the moment, because there's only so much time we can, we can devote to these questions, is from uh, Curon Howell, I believe it is. I think I've got the name right. Howells, sorry, uh, who asks... Is there a particular reason why so few Maltese crosses were kept and survived to the current day? Uh, a lay person like himself would expect at least a handful to have survived. So you see that that ties in with that previous question. We're talking about the original obliterators here. Um, yes. There's uh, it, it, the passage of time. It's really a long time ago. This the. Post office member used post offices used a lot of different hand stamps. Certainly, um, very few of them have survived from this sort of time period. Um, there is a story written up in the London Philatelist about the original find of this Maltese cross in Wangford in Suffolk um, from Patrick Pierce in the 1970s, and it was um, found in a box above an old post office. Um, I don't believe that they were actively recalled. They simply became obsolete. And as time went by, you know, if you've got tools in your tool shed that are more and more obsolete at some point, they just get thrown out. Nobody sees any great value yes. in keeping them. Yes. Okay, well, I can see that was the final question. Um, the others are all answers relating to Francis Abbott. Uh, apparently, yes, you're quite right. His biography is on, uh, on the British Museum uh, website. And ah. We're told by Frank Walton that he married a lady called Francis. So thank you all for your questions, everybody. And thank you very much, Howard, for answering them. Right. I should like, I'm just clicking on the right things here. I should like now to hand over to the president of the Royal, uh, Richard Stock. Richard, I think you'd like to make some uh, closing remarks. I certainly would. This is a subject which has interested me for many, many years, and I have a very small sideline collection of lining grave um, and, and some Maltese crosses, and I was absolutely fascinated to hear the story unfold and the way in which you did it. From the initial idea and the purpose and development of these councillors to not only obliterate the labels, but also to prevent their reuse and that was one of the basic tenets of the post office introducing them in the first place and you dealt then with the detail of the ink and its pre preparation the earliest known postal use being the 4th of may 1840 that made that surprised me and made me feel very pleased indeed because the 4th of may happens to be my birthday <laughs> and uh, although it was 105 years earlier <laughs> You then moved on to the chemists testing out the ink where they could remove the red ink on 
I think that was an early example of something that which we encountered all, all we encounter almost on a daily basis that there's always someone around who sees a an innovative development like that as a type of challenge and something to be try to try and overcome. What really impressed me was the way in which you put the story over and the balance that you established between each of the components that you were talking about. It was absolutely superb as well as being utterly fascinating. The rainbow trials, the obliteration report, the trial of the new black ink, the late use of the red ink, the unusual colors, distinctive crosses, the hand-drawn done it one, unusual usages, the replacement eventually of that obliterator in 1844 by numeral obliterators, and finally bringing it to a, a logical conclusion, the late use of the Maltese cross. It's one of the most iconic postmarks and cancellers ever used. And I think you handle that story in an utterly superb way that only an expert of your standing could possibly achieve. And I speak on behalf of everybody. Congratulations, Howard. It was a wonderfully entertaining evening and a job really, really well done. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Richard. That's thank very nice of you. Thank you. I'll now hand back to you, Mark, if yep. you have any other closing remarks you wish to make or all I wish to say is uh Obviously, I echo uh, your remarks there. I think it was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much, Howard. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, we are going to bring it to a close now. Um, but if anybody would like to continue to chat with um, Howard or indeed any, uh, the other members of the Royal uh, on this subject, please do come along to the Royal's booth, booth B2. And we will be on there and we'll be available for chatting, you know, through the, through the textual chat. Um, here in, uh, during virtual Stampex. So um, I think with that, it may be time for us to end this. And I wish I say I wish everyone in, I hope everyone enjoyed it, and I wish them a pleasant evening. So I'm going to draw this to a close now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mark.